In Genesis 1, God created the world, and he used the word good seven times. And on the sixth day after he created humanity, he stepped back and looked at his creation, and he goes, this is very good. The fact that God was saying good, he was affirming his original design and his intent to display his goodness, his power, his nature. You know, the first humans, Adam and Eve, they were created to love God and to love each other. They were given a good job to do, to subdue the world, to multiply, and through experiencing God's goodness, they can care for the world and care for each other. In its original state, creation was good. In fact, it was in God's perfect balance. You know, there's a word in the Bible called balance. It's called shalom. Shalom is everything in its right place, doing what it was meant to do in the way that God intended it to be, the way it was meant to be. It is the ultimate state of holistic and peace. You know, the, the world was good. It's like the people were good, the animals were good, the food were good. Heck, even the weather was good. No need to turn on the air conditioning. Everything was perfect. It's kind of like this bowl. It's beautiful, it's perfectly round, balanced, and functional as it's supposed to be. Until one day, the world got thrown upside down through the disobedience of mankind, disobedience to our good, good God. So much so that Paul wrote in Romans 8, that the whole creation has been groaning together. It groans for help. It groans for to be repaired. It groans for a redeemer. When people flung open the door and allowed this corrosive sin to enter into the world, it became off balance and broken. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel. I'm one of the pastors here at Island ECC, and it's great to see everyone here coming into our new series called Ask God, and I'm responsible for the topic, why do bad people, why, why do good people, <laughs> why do bad things happen to good people? In Romans 5.12, it says this, sin brings forth death and it spreads to all men. When human wants to be like God, wants to be wiser than God, when men and women want to rebel against God's love, the world enters into a broken state. Like this bowl. It's actually based on our intent, not God's intent. God's intent was for us to remain in holistic peace. Shalom. So the world was broken into multiple levels. Globally, interpersonally, and personally. We are off balance. The Bible states this. It says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. So how pervasive is this problem? It is very pervasive. Nation and nature are in the state of chaos and brokenness. Now on an interpersonal level, as the people separate themselves from the way of God following what they think seem what is right in their own eyes, Listen to this. They're following what seems right in their own eyes. It's not like, I want to do something bad in my own eyes. They're following what seems right in their own eyes. But the problem is, it's based on self-centeredness. We say things and do things that hurts the people that are closest to us. Maybe some of you argue before you came to church today. Husband say something and the wife is mad. Wife did something yesterday and the husband was frustrated. So both of you are frustrated and you take it out on your kids. Now your kids are agitated. 
Maybe last week at work, the meetings, there was a lot of frustration. And every man for themselves, they were just looking after them. And the clients take advantage of the vendors and vantage take away, take advantage of the clients, etc., etc. You've heard of that phrase, every man for themselves. And in Chinese it's Yan Bat Wai Tin Ju Dei meaning as if that is the way that we should live. Romans 132, Paul says this. They keep on doing evil things and they even encourage others to do them. You can read this. We keep on doing bad things to each other and we even encourage others to do the same. On a personal level, we live by the desire of our flesh. And in Galatians 5.19, Paul wrote this. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, etc., etc. This is quite a list. It was written 2,000 years ago. When you look at the world around us today, it doesn't seem like this much of a difference. Sin has created a chasm between God and his creation. And we have fallen from the source of life and the light of God. Don't you find that that every day you, you seem to be struggling with doing what is good and doing what is not right? I'm going to say something that's going to be hard to hear for everyone. The reality is you and I contribute to the bad things of this world. We are part of the problem. So if the problem is so pervasive, is there a solution to all of this? Okay, guys, there's a lot of us in this room, including those of you who are online. Let's put our heads together, okay? 24 hours. Clear up this mess. Silence. <laughs> so I'm not God, it's not my job. Okay. Let's say if you were God for 24 hours, what would you do? Some of you would be thinking, hmm, if I was God, it's very simple. I'll just sap all the bad guys away because <laughs> that's what they deserve. Bad people deserve to die. But the problem with this is before the end of 24 hours, everyone on planet Earth will be gone, including yourself. <laughs> now, there was a movie that I saw last year. Um, it's about a character called Robert McCall. He's an ex-CIA agent. No, he's somewhat of a juvenile, And then he takes care of people by his own judgment. He says, I need to do justice to this. He was somewhat of an equalizer. So the movie scene goes like he went to Italy to get something done. Uh, need to put down a guy. And in the midst of doing that, he got shot in the gut and then he was raising, he was escaping and he crashed in the highway. And then somehow he was taken to this small village in Italy where a gentle old doctor was taking care of him. And in the midst of healing him, this gentle doctor leaned over and asked Macau, he goes, are you a good man? Are you a good man? If I were to ask you, are you a good person? How would you answer that? Robert McCall turned to the doctor and said, I don't know. The truth is, if you're honest with yourself, some days you'll be looking in the mirror and you go, you know what? I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good girl. Yeah. And then another days, you wouldn't even dare to look into the eyes of your loved one because you are ashamed of the things that you have done or the thoughts that is in your mind or the desires that is in your heart. Let me share an insight from the scripture. It says, God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And in the New Testament, Jesus stated in Mark, he says, no one is good, but only God is good. So your next question will be, 
come on, God, why don't you just make everyone good? Easy. Remember, God did make us good in the beginning. However, because the ultimate expression of love is the freedom to choose. Just because I love you, I want you to love me out of your own heart, not some robotic programming. To freely love God is, is out of your own willingness. God gave us that choice because he loved us. But we use our God-given freedom to move away from God. Then the follow-up question could be, why bother even creating human beings in the first place? If somehow, somewhere down the line, you know someone will sin against you and then suffering and pain will come in, bad things will happen. Come on, God. If I may use this personal illustration to make a point, I have three wonderful sons, Ryan, 17, 115, and Ziki just turned 10. Our last baby now is double digited. <laughs> and there's a secret. I, I've I've been wanting to, to tell you, and I don't know how, but I, finally I decided I'm going to tell all of you my secret. The secret is, my three boys have never sinned ever since the beginning of their days. Never sinned, never made any mistake. They're perfect beings. Amazing, right? No, of course not. They sin and they're fallible just like my wife and I. And it's with all parents. We love them to the core, right? We teach them, we train them, we nourish them, we protect them, we provide for them, we spend time with them, we bring them to church, hoping that one day they'll continue to walk in the ways of God, being a righteous man after God's own heart, and to honor us and to love God all of their lives. Now the question comes down to, would I have decided not to have them because I know that somewhere, somehow, one of them, or all three of them, will sin against God and dishonor us? Would I choose not to have them? Would I disown my boys for the trouble and financial costs because of the negligence? Recently, one of our boys lost a laptop only a few days after I purchased it. <laughs> his name is whom I shall keep a secret for his <laughs> sake. But I tell you, it's one of my boys. Now, if any of my kids go astray, my wife and I would do anything and everything within our power to restore them back into the family, letting them know that they are forgiven when they return and they are well-loved and we have never stopped loving them. So my point is, in the same way, but a much bigger, unimaginable way, it is the heart of hearts of our Heavenly Father that all will return to him, to get to know him, to restore that brokenness and that relationship and dwell with him in eternity. The question continues, <laughs> okay, okay, you love and therefore you give them free choice. Okay, you're not gonna kill them all. The question then is, how does God heal this broken and off-balance world? The truth is, God doesn't want any of us to perish. He wants everyone to be restored back to shalom. He causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He allows the rain to rain on the just and the unjust. The just means people who know God, believed in Him, and are walking with Him. The unjust just means people who have yet to know Him, but God is hoping that they will one day also know Him. So this is a global, amazing grace for everyone to enjoy. He patiently waits for all of us to come back and return to him, not wanting anyone to perish. He doesn't want that. The solution is the gospel. The good news is a redemption plan that has already been set in motion. The imbalance of this world will be worked through from Jesus Christ who died on the cross for the price of our sins, which Romans says the wages of sin is death that we deserve. But instead of us dying, in this eternal condemnation, Christ says, who believes in me will not be condemned. Christ bore it all for us because he is the only perfect and sinless one and he's the only one that can pay for our debts. Now, Jesus is the potter that can 
mend our broken world and our brokenness together. Think of this broken bowl. It cannot get up by itself and mend itself back together. God will heal our inner brokenness. God will heal our interpersonal brokenness. And eventually, the whole world will restore back to shalom. But meanwhile, we're living in this state. It's the already but not yet state. Salvation has come. Redemption is in process. And shalom will be restored one day. So we're in between that process right now. The kingdom has already come, but it's not yet completed. So pain and suffering and bad things continues to happen. The promises of God, however, is ever so encouraging. Jesus said this. He says, in the world you will have tribulation, troubles. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Let me summarize a story that some of you might be familiar with in the book of John chapter 11. It illustrates the relationship between Jesus and the three siblings, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So the summary of the story is, it was, Jesus was told that Lazarus was sick, and then Jesus went to Bethany, and eventually, when he got there, Lazarus was already dead for four days. While Jesus was there, Jesus wept because he was moved and greatly disturbed by all the people's sorrow. Although afterwards, momentarily, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So a happy ending, a nice bow on the top. Great. Yes. <laughs> but the intriguing part of this story is not raising from the dead. The intriguing part was Jesus wept. I'm sure all of you have wept. Well, some of you have wept. And it's weeping. Weeping is not like some tiny little droplets of tear that rolls down from the side of your cheek when you see a very moving story. Weeping is like, ah, ooh. You've seen your kids weep. You probably have wept because of the suffering that you have experienced. Someone close to you died, and it's pretty normal, right? When you go to a funeral and someone that's dear to you, you weep and you cry. It's normal. But when Jesus cried, it's kind of intriguing because Jesus is the Son of God. Only moments later, he would raise Lazarus from the dead. He knows the outcome. So why would you cry over something that you know will be resolved momentarily? Take a few seconds to think about that. Why bother crying when you know the outcome will be good? Why? It is because he cares. Jesus enters into our emotion. He enters into what we're experiencing. God's heart is broken when we are broken. When we cry, He knows our pain and suffering. And He's there alongside of us. Because we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our pain, our weaknesses, the bad things that happen. But one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Do you know that tears in the original language has to do with stress and anger? Jesus is at mad at the pain and suffering of this world. Jesus is mad and angry about the tomb and death that brings because death was never part of God's plan. John 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they died. The last week we heard from Pastor Brett about the reliability of the Bible. That the account of Jesus' resurrection has over 500 plus eyewitnesses. If you missed the sermon, go back and watch it. I was so touched by it. You know, Jesus defeated death and was raised from the dead. And that's why we celebrate Easter all over the world. Because it really happened. Go search it out. Go look through historian documents. It's real. And this is the good news, guys. For those of us who believe in Christ and His resurrection power, death to all of us who believe is only but a door into eternity. For those of us who believe in Christ, death is only but a door into eternity. 
Wow. You know, I experienced my father's journey to his passing in the last two months. My dad was in the ICU, so I went back during CNY. And then the doctor says, I think he's getting better. Uh, so we're going to move him out to rehabilitation center in a few days' time. And my time was up. My return ticket was on, and I was willing to stay if there's anything else that happened. I brought my black suit, and I bought my black Bible. I was prepared for anything. But the doctor says, I think he's doing well. So I flew back to Hong Kong, and on my birthday in early March, I received a WhatsApp video while I was enjoying a good time with my wife celebrating my birthday. Dad has passed away only a few days, unexpectedly, after he checked into the rehabilitation center. Bad things happen to good people. I saw how my dad handled his sickness and his approach to death. He asked me to conduct his funeral before he passed away, and the funeral was full of love. Lots of tears, mseta. But at the same time, a lot of thanksgiving and deep joy. Even at ICU, I remember dad was still <laughs> sweet talking to mom and making her smile and laugh a little. My dad left this world in peace. He knew because he knew where he was going and where he will be. And then something amazing happened. God was so gracious that he used dad's life in our families even after he was gone. Through my father's death, as our family grieved together and sharing fond memories of you know, our dad and his time with us, something clicked in two of our family members' mind. It, it, it's as if God reached in and untied those metal dead knot that has been tightened and tightened and tightened for many, many years. Two miracles happened. One was a long misunderstanding of love. No matter how we say it, I don't believe it. The misunderstanding of love is now understood. The other one was a broken relationship that all of us within the family and extended family says, well, we, we pray, but I don't think we'll see that, that relationship will be reconciled on this side of heaven. Maybe one day when all will be well. That broken relationship the hatred and the misunderstanding between these two people was reconciled before our very own eyes. There was unspoken and indescribable peace. As a family, we held on to the eternal hope that we will see our Father one gate one day. That is such an amazing gift from God. I do not know why bad things happen to my dad. He was doing well, he was eating well, he was walking well. His mind was, was bright and sharp and he writes us devotional and sent it to all of us to see all over the world. I don't know why bad things happened to him, but the result was beautiful. The result was beautiful. Just as God promised, he turned ashes into beauty. You know that one day our world will be fully redeemed. But for now, we're still living in the already but not yet state of this redemption process. You know that our God is not some dreamed up divine deity that lives somewhere else in heaven. That we wanted to believe there's a greater good, there's, there's a God, and so I could hold on to this crutch so I could feel better about myself when I'm down and out and Bad things happen to me. No, he's, he's a living God that walks with us as we see in the story of John 11. By seeing John 11 and understanding through my own experience, it helps me to understand that I have this God with me through my pain and suffering. I understand who this God is in my life now. I want to read a quote from a theologian, an author, a pastor that passed away last year through pancreatic cancer in an early age of 72. He was a great man. And he says this, Christianity teaches that contra-fatalism, suffering is overwhelming. 
A lot of you are going through some suffering and bad stuff right now. Don't let anyone tell you that it's okay, let it pass, it's all right. No, it's overwhelming. Contra Buddhism, suffering is real. You don't detach from your emotion because he died, he really died. Contra karma, suffering is often unfair. Just because I did something good doesn't mean something good will come back. Just because I did something bad doesn't mean I will receive that punishment this lifetime. Just because I was a good man all through my life, will I become a dog in my next life? Will I become a woman? Who will I be? I don't know, based on karma. Oh my gosh, how am I going to live this life? Contra secularism. Suffering is meaningful. There's a purpose to it. And if faced rightly, it can drive us like a nail deep into the love of God and into more stability and spiritual power than you could ever imagine. And before this person passed away, he says, you know what? Everything in this life is going to be taken away from us except for one thing. What is that one thing? God's love, which can go into death with us and take us through it and into his arms. This was Pastor Tim Keller. He wrote his last book while he was having cancer to let us know that the Lord is real. So what is my part to play? Starting on a personal level, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. Let God work in you. If you're the one that is suffering right now, if you're the one that something bad has happened to you, do not waste your journey. Let God work in you and use your ashes to turn into beauty. Let your experience be someone be something that you could help others with because you have walked through the burning coals. You have been baptized with fire. Let it turn into something good. Paul wrote in Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. And that is why for Christ's sake, this is what Paul says, I delight in my weakness in people insulting me. I delight in my hardship, in my persecution, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, I am strong. Paul is the one that says, to live is for Christ and to die is to gain. How amazing. And if you want to read about the, the story of Paul, he, he was one of those ones that do not believe in Jesus. He's the one that actually goes against Jesus. He was the unjust. But another sermon, another time. And he goes on and says, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. How can you say that? Rejoice in suffering. Amazing. Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. What a great process that God has given us. It is hope that others can see our Lord Christ is real. When the rubber meets the road, right? It's not a Sunday thing, I feel happy. It's a self-help kind of thing that I come in, I sing some song, I listen to some good messages, I feel better. So Monday comes along and I, you know, I roll along another five days, I get tired. I come back and I, you know, I feel good and I'm singing some songs. And it's not that, it's real. When the rubber meets the road, when bad things happen to you, when you just Play that deep joy that only Christ can give you through the hope of his resurrection power, then, only then, we will develop a heart to know what it really means to love. Love is not transactional. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. You do this good, and I'll do that good to you. You give me some gift, I'll give you a bigger gift, hoping that you'll give me an even bigger gift. It's not on that shallow end of lovey-dovey. Although those things are good. Gifts are good. I love gifts. <laughs> I love for you to scratch my back. But the deeper love allows us to know what it means to walk with joy. How to live in peace. Understanding how to be patient and kind to those around us. And as you open up your heart for God to work in you, He will transform you to understand His goodness. And then we can be gentle to others because 
God was gentle to you while you were against him, while you were doing bad things to other people. And then we will begin to see the good things about having self-control. We stop from isolating. When we want to run away from people because so many have hurt me, I start using substances and behavior to numb my pain. And God says, why it's good to have self-control? Because it's actually stopping yourself from hurting yourself and eventually hurting those around you. On an interpersonal level, I encourage you, be a peacemaker. You can stop being the source of suffering. You can stop being the source of suffering because you choose to make peace instead of paying evil with evil, but paying evil with love. Matthew says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. We pay evil with love because this is what God has called you to do. And he will grant you his blessing. Practically, pray for your frenemies. <laughs> Practically, pray for someone who is really against you. Don't be that judge because we always have our agendas. Let God be that perfect judge. He says, vengeance is on me. Number three, be a servant to other. At today's beginning of today's message, I spoke about God giving us freedom to choose because it is an act of love. Galatians 5.13 says this, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Remember that list of fleshly actions and behaviors. Let me paraphrase from Philippians 2, 3. Now if you experience Christ's encouragement, if love means anything to you, if you have tasted God's goodness and have received his kindness, deep sympathy and forgiveness, live together in harmony, serve others around you in love. Do not act from motives of rivalry or personal vanity, but in humility, think more of each other than do yourselves. So be an agent to reduce suffering. And lastly, please, please remember, hold on to the promises of God. Revelation says, I am making everything new. There shall be no more curses. In the book of Isaiah, it says, the former things will be gone. They will be remembered no more. The old orders of things which accompanying sorrow, tragedy will be gone. And the new heaven and earth will be here, free from sin, evil, sickness, suffering, and death. And shalom will be restored. That perfect balance, that holistic peace. In closing, I want to go back to my illustration at the beginning of this message to summarize all of this. There's a Japanese art called the Kanzuki, the golden journey. A bowl was whole, and then it was broken, and now it's remented. It started back in the 15th to 16th century, and then when the pottery is broken, the highly skilled craftsmen would take some tree sap and some other materials and start mending the broken pieces and put it back together, adorning it with gold. And quite often at the end, the final product becomes much more precious, artistic, and valuable, and even better looking than it was in its original state. Our world and all of us are broken. But God, in his grandeur of restoration process, is putting us back together by the grace of his son, Jesus Christ. We are on this golden journey of being remented. Shalom is yet to come. And when you dig deeper into the question, today we ask, why bad things happen to good people? Perhaps a better question would be, why did the worst death happen to the perfectly good God? Why did Jesus have to die for us? Think about that. Why did the worst death 
have to happen to a perfectly good God? The answer is simple. Because you are his child. You are precious. You are so well loved by him. In a comparable but in a much bigger cosmic scale. It's like the parents for his kids. Our father would do everything and anything, even enduring the worst death and pain in order to save and restore the brokenness inside of you and inside of me. God wants you to live the life that he intended for you to live, which is abundant and free. His love and amazing grace is displayed on the cross. So friends, if you're here at church for the very first time or you're in the process of seeking, who is this God? What's the big deal? I'm proposing a question for you. Will you accept and explore God's indescribable love for you today? In the quietness of your own heart, you just have to say this prayer. It says, God, I'm opening up my heart to see if you're real. I want to know you more. God, help me to receive your love. God, I want to be restored. Would you say that prayer? For the followers of Christ, will you continue to recommit to live a life that testifies his goodness, his greatness, and to live a life that is worthy of his death, worthy of his calling? Why bad things happen to good people? Why did the worst death happen to the perfectly good God? Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you We thank you because you say in Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. In fact, Father, you hold us in the palm of your hand without brokenness. You meant it with your mercy and grace through everything. Through that golden journey, you put us back together. You restore ourselves, you restore our broken relationship with others, and eventually you will restore the entire world because of your love and grace. So Father, I pray for all of us to open our hearts so that you can work and transform within us, so we can walk and walk in your delight of your love and grace. In Jesus' name, we pray together as one. Amen.